When representing the whole animal, our starting point in the 70s was to take some other theropod, like a megalosaur, and bolt our giant Dinochirus arms onto it. Reconstructions in this category vary a lot, from gangly monsters, sometimes with a crocodile-like head for whatever reason, to somewhat more plausible-looking giant Silurosaurs. What they have in common is that they always emphasize the animal's long reach. It's always slashing at prey or, or ripping chunks out of prey because it's always a carnivore. It's always using its claws as meat hooks to tear apart other animals. These depictions appear more often in written form than in actual artwork, though some modern paleo artists have done some plausible reconstructions of what it might have looked like if somebody at the time had painted one of these. I was surprised that despite the length of the forelimbs, reconstructions in this category are rarely portrayed as a quadruped, as using the arms for locomotion. That's more the dino sloth specialty. Remember Rajditzvensky's idea that ornithomimids would be hooking at tree branches with their forelimbs? He took it further than that, building on Osborne's comparisons of ornithomimid forelimbs to those of sloths. He reconstructed the entire animal as a sloth dinosaur. And you might be thinking, oh, so like we reconstruct for Therizinosaurus, it's a, it's a ground sloth analog. Not yet. Rajasvensky thought that ornithomimids and their relatives were scansorial, tree climbing, that because their hands faced one another, it brought them into a natural hooking posture. As we now know, practically all theropods had their hands normally facing each other, but that was not known at the time. In Rajasvensky's reconstruction, the arms aren't just long, they are the longest part of the body. The animal has a very short torso and legs. Even so, I am curious what kind of trees he thought Nemegd had to support a ton or more of dinosloth hanging off of them.